You're listening to Lucid Cafe. I'm your host, Wendy Halley. Hello, and thanks for joining me for another episode of Lucid Cafe. I want to start out by saying how excited I am to let you know that I'm in the process of creating an online course for anyone who's interested in becoming their own shaman. I've been wanting to do this for years, and just recently the stars aligned or the planets or whatever, and it's finally happening. I'm taking everything I've learned over the years as a shamanic practitioner and workshop facilitator, which has been over 20 years now, and distilling it down to make the process as accessible as possible. I'm hoping that by this summer, the summer of 2024, I'll have the first introductory module available where you'll learn how to open shamanic doors into the transpersonal realms, holy shit, such rich territory to learn and grow and experience how multifaceted reality is. And you are. I mean, you can't merge with the essence of a tree and be the same afterwards. <laughs> Having a personal shamanic practice is transformative. If you're interested in experiencing that course, you can sign up for my newsletter to get updates. Uh, the newsletter comes out about every six weeks or so. I try not to inundate your inboxes. And I'll have updates there about the class. Or you can subscribe to the podcast where I'll also be giving updates. Okay, so let's get to today's episode. My guest, Brandy Gilmore, went from working in network engineering and operations to being disabled for years. And then she became the number one rapid results healing expert. In this episode, Brandy shares how she discovered how to heal herself and how she uses what she learned to help others heal. In her new book, Master Your Mind and Energy to Heal Your Body, Brandy reveals the key to unlocking these results to help you gain clarity and understanding of self healing in a way that's mind expanding. Please enjoy my conversation with Brandy Gilmore. Brandy, thank yes. you so much for joining me. Wendy, thank you so much for inviting me to join you. It's beautiful to connect with you. Well, I am eager to talk to you about your book. It's called Master Your Mind and Energy to Heal Your Body. You Can Be Your Own Cure is the subtitle. I can yeah. get behind that. Yes. So you have quite a story. I would love to start probably where everybody wants you to start in these conversations by hearing a bit about what happened to you that led you to write this book. It is literally the last thing that I ever thought that I would be doing was writing a book on mind, body, <laughs> um, <laughs> ever mind, body, energy, any of that. Um, so I used to do network engineering and operations and basically I had an accident and technically I had two, I had a car accident and then I had a fall and I fell just wrong, just right. However you want to say it. Uh, but basically I went from living a full life to being wheelchair walker, cane, you know, on a good day, I could get out with my wheelchair walker cane. And on a bad day, I didn't get out of bed and I was just on morphine and extreme pain for many, many years. And my doctor said that there was nothing they could do to, for me to heal. And I was literally started trying diet and supplements and everything that I could find. And there was an interesting turn of events. Every time I went to any type of specialist, I would say, well, I just, it, you have to have some, there's something like you have to, like, I wouldn't want to leave the office until they could give me some type of referral. Cause it was like, I couldn't lose hope of my future, you know? And so the hospital, one of the top research hospitals that I've been going to got me into a study. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is going to be amazing. I, I'm going to get my life back. Cause that's what you hope for. You hope somebody's going to invent something new. And so they got me into this study and I literally remember counting down the days to this study thinking, oh my gosh, like I felt like a kid before Christmas, like I'm going to get my life back. And long story short, on the day of the study comes, my friend 
wheels me and takes me into the hospital, wheels me in my wheelchair. They get me all prepped in the hospital for the procedure. And the doctor, he comes in and he says, you know, I'm sorry, but you can't be a part of this study. We, we don't expect you to get better. And I just felt like there was this tennis ball in my throat. Like I swallowed it. Like I just was choking back the tears, just trying to be okay. And the next memory I have, I'm laying in my same bed at home and I'm in all of this pain and, and I don't even want to live. I'm just like, what's the point after I left? It's just like, I'm, I'm not going to get better. I can't live like this. And then I had this voice or thought come into my mind that was like, well, Brandy, but what about the placebo? In that moment, I thought, you know, it's a known fact that a certain percentage of people can get better. And I had already been trying to positive thinking, meditation and theta state, all of these things weren't working, but I, it led me to really explore why does the mind work? What is, what's happening and how does it work and how can I get real results? And it just led me on this incredible journey that now has led me to write this book. Because okay. So it started with the rejection from the study. Yeah. You're already kind of going down that road, exploring what would help me feel better. Yeah. It, the, the rejection from the study was more so, it made me ground the information because before I had been doing the meditation and visualizing and theta state, like trying to, and it made me say, okay. And, it, and it, I was all over the place. It wasn't like anything was linear. I was like, I'll try this and a 10 of these and five of these, whatever it was, I didn't care. Yeah. But what I would say that did is it made me say, okay, well, there's the placebo. And so what happened is then I started saying, okay, well, I'm going to convince myself I'm already healed because I thought that the placebo worked based on belief. However, when it wasn't working and wasn't working and I was, I was really good at convincing myself so much. So I had like multiple realities. I was pushing myself and it wasn't working. And then I finally, as I was researching, came across the awareness that there's something called an open label placebo where both the doctor and the patient both know it's fake and it still works. And I was like, well, wait a so second. So how does that work? Yeah. Yeah. Like if, and so if they both know that it's fake, then it's not all about belief. And that's what, you know, I, so then it led me on this journey where I started looking at like another thing that was just eye opening was multiple personality disorder. The awareness that people can have different illnesses when they're in different personalities. They could have back pain and allergies in one personality and asthma and heart palpitations or headaches or whatever it is. In Crazy, other. right? Crazy. One personality is left-handed, the other is right-handed. And <laughs> yeah, and I'm um, different body temperature, blood pressure, all of these things. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. and what was also fascinating was a few things: was medically documented illnesses were not present in in the other personality. And there's even a, a woman who's medically documented blind in some personalities, and not in others. And so, what was what was also fascinating was that it was always in the same personality. So meaning that if one person, she maybe called herself Jane, but let's say she had an alternate personality that called herself Sue, maybe Sue always has back pain, but Jane always has headaches and a different personality. And it could always have something else. And it was consistent with the same personality. And so it really helped me to start looking at the awareness that it must be in our mindset somewhere. And of course, at the same time, I started researching energy and how that was all connected and, and biochemistry. And so it was just this entire, <laughs> just delving into research saying, how does this work? It's quite mysterious. I've always been interested to figure out why some people heal really well and thoroughly and other people don't. But the common denominator is that they both want to heal. Yeah. And I mean, this is the thing is obviously like I researched for about six years. So for me to do that day in and day out and research, I actually found that it was like, it was not only like an addiction, it was a form of survival. I found on the days that I didn't research, if I didn't research for a couple of days in a row, uh, my world was black. I was not in a good state at all. I was depressed and everything. So I was just, it was a survival. And so I wanted to get better, obviously, the entire time, but it was still about also understanding how does it work? And that's basically one of the things that was key is our minds do so much more than people realize. Our minds direct our energy. And a lot of people think spiritual, like the energy is just a spiritual notion, but technically on the medical side, 
there was a medical scientist who discovered biophotons or energy, light energy from the body back in the 1920s and was nom nominated for the Nobel Prize 11 times. And so it's interesting that in our world, 100 years later, here we are, even with a lot of people thinking that energy is just a woo-woo thing or a spiritual notion when it's, I mean, there, there's even research on light energy from the body that's in a database that's like a collaborative database that's run by Harvard and the Smithsonian. So, I mean, it's very much real, but it's funny how many people don't realize that it's real. Let's talk about the biophoton and how that relates to the body and healing. So many ways. Okay. So if we said exactly what you just mentioned, you said, how does it relate to the body and healing? So that was your specific question. And it's an exciting question. I love this question. So there are so many ways. So a, a few things. First, research has shown that different illnesses can emit different types of frequencies. So for example, somebody who has type 2 diabetes, they'll have higher biophoton emissions from the navel area, but less from the forehead compared to somebody who is non-diabetic. And, and kind of to go bigger picture for a moment, just to make sure that everybody has a, an idea of biophotons. An easy way to think about it is this, is that if you picture, if you think about a particle of light, so a light bulb emits particles of light or the sun emits particles of light and they're called photons. And now the body has biophotons and basically they're called biophotons because it's from a biological organism. Now, initially I mentioned that they were discovered in the 1920s. So Alexander Gerswich is the one who discovered them and he initially called it mitogenetic radiation, but then later it was renamed to biophotons. And so basically a researcher named Pop um, actually renamed them to biophotons. But what's fascinating about biophotons is, is one, I, as I just mentioned, different illnesses have different frequencies, even cancerous cells have different frequencies. Another thing that's really interesting is that research suggests that this light energy can actually communicate things like homeostasis throughout the body and information throughout the body. Now, some people might think, how's light energy going to communicate information throughout the body? If we look at Wi-Fi, I mean, internet everywhere, fiber optics. So fiber optics is exactly that, is a glass tube with light that's transmitting cable, internet, emails, text messages all over the world. So light is actually really good at carrying information. And so, and so there's, there's so many ways. I mean, I, I could go into a, another way. Alexander Gerswich, when he first discovered light energy, one of the things that he discovered about it is it had the ability to influence cellular proliferation. And what cell proliferation is, is basically a simple way to think about it is if you picture dish soap, if you pour water on dish soap, it bubbles up. And so it grows and divides, grows and divides. And basically our cells, when we're working on wound healing, they grow and divide, grow and divide, grow and divide. Or there's also abnormal cell proliferation, which is something like tumor or right. cancer or whatnot, or even, but a lot of illnesses are connected to abnormal proliferation, such as rheumatoid arthritis or all kinds of things. So but basically, in his studies, he found that this light energy could actually influence cellular proliferation. And that was profound. So there's just so many different things that are profound about it. And further, research has shown that our minds and our thoughts and our emotions can actually influence the biophoton emissions that are coming from our body. I was wondering if in your research, if you ever came across, and I don't remember reading this in your book, and maybe I did, and I, I forgot, and I'll blame it on my postmenopausal brain. <laughs> <laughs> but when you're looking at the frequency of sound and that our systems, when they're out of harmony, they actually have, I mean, it's like sound related. And so like sound healing is all about bringing disharmony back into harmony. Did you ever come across anything along those lines? A lot of the sound stuff, because I, I, as far as music and whatnot, one of the things that I love about music is, is you know, if you bring in intense positivity with music, it can, of course, increase dopamine and, and biochemical, yeah. you know, an emotional positive. yeah reaction. Yeah. To it. 
a strong emotional reaction to it, which is which is beautiful. I would say that this type of energy, this the working with biophotons in this way, it is a bit different in that that it was directly linked to emotions. But I say that with a with a big however, and this is the reason why, is because research has shown that there's a direct correlation between a person's thoughts and emotions and their biophoton emissions. And so if somebody is, of course, listening to music and enjoying it, then presumably that would definitely obviously create a difference in biophoton emissions. Now, there's other interesting things, such as there was a research study where researchers asked participants to visualize white light. And as they did, they were able to see increased biophoton emissions out of the right side of their heads, but not out of the left side. And so what's interesting is, is that it also shows that energy and biophoton emissions can increase in certain parts of the body and not others as well. And so I would say it really depends on what's going on in a person's mind. You know, people with anger, they'll have increased biophoton emissions. And so sometimes you'll hear people say, well, just increase your energy, increase your energy. Well, that's not the case. That's, that's not the answer because cancer cells have increased biophoton emissions. So it's not, it's not just about increasing it. Uh, it's about creating that shift. But of course, going back to your, uh, your comment about music. Just sound in general, tones and, and that kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, if you think about it for a moment, knowing that there's a direct correlation, that research has shown there's a direct correlation between EKG and biophoton emissions, then definitely it would really depend on how a person's feeling and taking in that music, but absolutely. It's all frequency, whether it's light frequency or sound frequency, it's operating on this level that is sub-perceptual. As you can probably tell from my book, I love to geek out on the research stuff. So in other words, basically what I kind of did is I took all of the pieces, like what I try to do is everything that I ever say and do, I like to do research on it and show it. So that's actually kind of what led to the book is basically after I healed myself, I thought people are going to think I'm nuts to go from a wheelchair, <laughs> walker, cane. I mean, I was a mess. My legs were about the same size as my arms. And I thought going from network engineering and operations to, I, I mean, I was like right now, I'm about 125. You know, I'm 5'8", five, 5'9", five, 125. And I was 93 pounds. I was, so oh I had my, lost yeah. like 30 something pounds. I was, I was a mess. And I was weak and I mean, just, oh, I was a mess. And so I thought people, people are going to think I'm nuts that I somehow healed with my mind. And, and I was like, okay, well, my initial thought was, I'm just going to show my doctors how I did this. They're going to want to share it with everybody. <laughs> and I was like, but I just have to show them how it works. And so it sent me on this journey to say, okay, I just have to show other people. So I would then start showing other people and then taking people and showing them how to release pain with their own mind. And they were like, oh my gosh, my pain is gone. And people started asking me to speak. And so I started speaking on stages. Then I would take people from the audience who were experiencing pain and I would show them how to shift out of pain. And then there was one time when I was getting off stage and I thought sometime, at some point, somebody's going to say, that can't be real. That's got to be a plant, a fake person faking that they have neck pain or back pain or whatever. Hmm. And, you know, that would have been me because I was world's biggest skeptic. Right, right. <laughs> That would have been me. So, so I thought, well, I have to show this under medical equipment so people can see it. And then that drove me to then show it under thermal medical equipment. So you can actually see the pain where the pain is there and you can see it on the scan and then it's gone just from somebody using their mind. And so it's just been this unplanned, this passion to then after I healed myself that I just, I hate seeing other people who are sick and stuck and in pain. And it's like, but I just want to show everybody, hey, we can do this. We're all amazing. It's not just me. It doesn't have to be this way. That was the thing that really struck me about your book is the first third of it reads like a, a detective novel in a way that you're, <laughs> <laughs> we have this bird's eye view of every step you took in your journey to figure out what the hell is going on and how do I heal myself and trying to understand how this all works. And then the rest of your book is dedicated to sharing what you learned and how you put it together in these techniques. I think it would be cool if you wouldn't mind giving like a, an overview of the techniques or maybe a taste, a sample, like what you would do when you bring somebody on stage to 
help them uh, reduce their pain or eliminate their pain? Like, what is it that you learned and how do you describe it to folks? All right. So I would say a a few things and I'm just going to like pour into you for a moment. So here we go. So I would say one thing I learned was this, is that different combinations of emotions affect the body differently. And this was foundational. A simple way to think about it is this, is that if somebody's embarrassed, their face can turn red. Or if they have a panic attack, that's a different emotion. Or sexual thought, that can affect the body in a completely different way. Now, of course, as I'm going through my injury, we've all heard of stress and emotions before. And I thought, I need a lot more than emotions to help me out of this situation. But then I started looking at a few things. Number one, that one study after another, after another, after another has shown that optimism after surgery can dramatically influence healing rates, that people have much better success rates, cellular proliferation is improved. And if they're in fear or anger or upset, that their healing is much slower. They can have a lot higher complications, rehospitalization, all of these things. And I thought, well, that's after surgery. So there's got to be at least something to these emotions. And then And then, of course, looking at it and thinking about the widowhood effect, where a senior can lose a spouse and have a much higher rate of death. And I thought, okay, well, I can also see that emotions can actually impact us to the point of death. And there's many different ways that's recorded. And so so it was that. It was really understanding that in so many ways, our emotions, whether you want to look at the brain-body connection and and the homunculus map, but understanding the brain-body connection or energy or biochemistry or whatnot. We can see there's so many ways. And so then because I continue to analyze MPD, you know, or DID, and, and what I mean by that is multiple personality disorder, or it's also known as disassociative identity disorder. And the awareness that different personalities could have different ailments and also people who are happy could have illness also. And what I started to realize was it was a certain combination of emotions. And the easiest way to think about it is like this, is that if somebody wants to make cake and they have flour, well, they can't make cake, but if they mix it with eggs and butter and other ingredients or vegan eggs and butter and other ingredients, they can of course make cake. Now, of course, illness is a lot different than cake, but my point being is <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> much different. Believe me, I'm more than cake. If only, if only it was as easy as cake. And so it was just it realizing that, that just like food, different ingredients create different things. So somebody can have PTSD and they may not have a health issue, but it depends on the combination of emotions. So that was one thing. So when I work with people under medical equipment or even to get results, that's part of the process is, okay, identifying what specific emotion and what specific pattern and then transforming that. So that is a key thing. And so even when I work with people under medical equipment, that's what I'll do is I'll identify, okay, what are the specific ingredients? What do I need to help them to then shift? And so that was a profound awareness. Now, creating that change was one thing. Another thing was a lot of times people are trying to work on one specific trauma, but we have patterned ways of thinking and feeling that persist. And so a lot of times if somebody's experienced a trauma, it's part of a bigger pattern. That's what I experienced is I had a trauma and it was part of a patterned way of thinking and feeling. So in other words, for example, somebody may have a pattern of feeling abandoned and yet they can have traumatic abandonment, so to speak, multiple times throughout their life and also have a pattern of it in little ways that show up all of the time. And so my point is, is it to get results, it wasn't just about solving one trauma. It was about understanding that there's a patterned way of thinking and feeling and then shifting that. And so that was really profound. I could go on and on, but that was a key. Yeah, that's a huge one, right? I mean, I think what you're insinuating is the power of the unconscious mind and how these patterns get embedded because of conditioning and or trauma and a variety of other ways that we don't even realize how much they're influencing us. And you're suggesting that, now correct me if I'm wrong here, you're suggesting that these patterns can influence how well you heal or don't heal. Absolutely. And 
even if we look at the bigger picture, there's been one research study after another that shows even optimism can help protect from different types of illnesses. And even people who are optimistic can live about 15% longer than others. And so we can see that, that there, that our emotions affect our body and our longevity and, and all of that. Now, what I started looking at was even if we look at Freud's work, or we look at things like repetition compulsion or reenactments or attraction theory or law of attraction, whatever you want to call it, we have patterned ways of thinking and feeling, and we attract on that similar note. So let's say that somebody has a pattern of self-criticism where another person might have a pattern of feeling guilty or another person may have a pattern of abuse. And, you know, kind of a, a common example that I'll give is, is unfortunately, we've all heard before that a woman can have an abusive father and then leave him and find the abusive boyfriend, boss, spouse, et cetera, et cetera. Now she's not trying to do that on purpose. It's not like she leaves her father and says, I hope to have an abusive man of or course. husband, yeah. you know, but that continues. And so our subconscious mind plays out in our life more than we realize. And that's what reenactments or repetition compulsion is all about is the awareness that our minds have a tendency to go back to the same trauma, the same emotional experience over and over and over again. And so what I started looking at was exactly that is saying, okay, well, there's embarrassment effects. The We know that, that uh, somebody, their face can turn red or panic attack or sexual thought. And I thought, well, we can see these emotions affect the body or somebody's nervous or somebody can have so much fear that they get scared, their heart skips a beat. That's their heart. <laughs> I thought, well, okay, if we know these emotions affect the body, well, what are the other emotions doing that we don't know? And, and you're talking fact, about the obvious ones versus the not obvious ones, right? Well that, said. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Well said. Absolutely. And, and so realizing that these emotions are running in our subconscious mind and so it was, it was about that. It was about understanding, okay, well, what is the patterned way of thinking and feeling? What are the specific emotions that are affecting me and, and how do I create a real shift and change them? And that's probably the most challenging aspect, right? Is how to become aware of shit that you're not aware of. How to become aware of shit you're not, that's a good way to say it. I like that. Exactly. <laughs> well said. <laughs> well, that, that's yeah. why I love the word lucid so much. Lucid is probably my favorite word. Because, I love that because it's about awareness, like how to be more aware and awake while you're living your life, not just lucid while you're dreaming, but lucid while you're out and about. So yeah. How did you figure out how to become aware of shit that you're not aware of? Well, basically multiple ways. I would say one is that if we look at the analogy of somebody who's really, really, really upset and they're really, really upset and you try to reason with them. How does it go? Not so well. <laughs> but if they calm down, they can see things in a different way. They have a greater sense of self-awareness. They can have a greater sense of seeing the situation. And so I kind of took that to a much deeper level and said, okay, well, the more I can calm my mind and really calm my mind and then also start tuning in and noticing what I'm really feeling the more I can become aware. And, and so there were, again, there, there were multiple things that I did, but that was one is, is starting to, to do that and to understand also that the more that I could calm emotions, the more I could see with more clarity. Now, a lot of times when people think about calming emotions, they'll think about meditation. But one of the things that I actually needed to do was I needed to stop meditating because I had been meditating so much. And I had trained my brain to start ignoring what was in my subconscious mind. Where, ah, okay. Yeah. So where I thought I was doing it wrong. Thought comes into your mind, you ignore it. A thought comes into your mind, you ignore it. And, and not only that, but I was just training myself to just be okay with whatever thought. And then I started to realize, wait a second, if there's thoughts coming into my mind, they're <laughs> coming from one place. So my I should pay attention and maybe they have a story to tell me. Yeah. So instead of ignoring them, I started understanding them and thinking in a different way. Well, it's a different kind of meditation, right? I mean, it's still sort of a meditation. It's an inward focus instead of that kind of more like, oh, watching the thoughts 
float by and ignoring them or whatever, however you did it. It's more like trying to hone in on them and discover what they have to say. Yeah, like that. Except and not. so I did that. <laughs> no, no, no. It, it goes back to the multiple things. I was so out of touch with my emotions. I think when I worked in technology, I didn't even know I had emotions. I thought. Oh, okay. So you were like, starting kind of from square one, huh? Oh, yes. Maybe even square zero. I felt like if, <laughs> okay. you, if you did not have an emotion in a moment, it did not exist. Okay. Like the idea. And remember, I mean, I was injured in 03. So I have now been healed now for over, well over 13 years now. So. So it was 20 years ago and I didn't know what the subconscious mind was. I mean, I was literally, I was new to all of it. And one epiphany for me was I thought, well, intense emotions had to be the key if it's going to be emotions. And I was like, but I'm not feeling any emotions. Ah, uh, okay. And then I started to realize, oh, well, subtle emotions. If I had a subtle emotion three weeks ago, and then again, I noticed it two weeks ago. And then again, a couple minutes ago, it could only mean one thing. It's buried in my subconscious mind and it's somehow a programmed way of thinking and feeling. So that mm. was an epiphany. And instead of saying that subtle emotions don't matter, I began to realize they matter more. I could see how profound that must have been then if you felt like you really didn't have a relationship with your emotionality and then you start investigating your emotions that must have been like, holy crap, this big wealth of information. And then it's like, oh, I can start working with this. I can start understanding myself in ways that I haven't before. Yes. And I mean, when I say that I didn't realize I had emotions, I mean, obviously. Or you didn't have a relationship not, with them. That's more. Have a real, yeah. 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 I, I didn't. I mean, I was. Even at the time, my doctors had said, well, because I, I was depressed, but they said something like I was depressed. And I'm like, I'm not depressed. I have a problem. Like if I didn't have this problem, I wouldn't be depressed. <laughs> very logical. <laughs> it's very logical. I'm not, it's not depression. And, and at the time, you know, maybe 20 years ago, there might've been a little stigma about that. So I was like, I was, def I was like, I'm not depressed. I have a problem if the problem would go away. So I don't have a depression problem. I have an injury problem. <laughs> it's in response to a really shitty circumstance. So of course I'm experiencing sadness or depression or whatever, but and fear and mm -hmm. oh, all I of mean, it. My whole yeah. world felt like it yeah, was, was crashing down and, and uh, yeah. It must've been horrible. You know, because I've deleted all of those, I, th my biggest emotion is that I wouldn't want to go through it again. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't take it back if I could, because the way it changed my life, it literally, Absolutely, yeah. my life changed so much. <laughs> it's incredible. And that's why even in the book, I call it the gift in healing, because I see people like I've worked with people who have gone from uh, even just releasing physical pain, but even, I mean, worked with other people who were bedridden, who have had tumors, who have had autoimmune conditions, all kinds of things. And when it's like, when you really understand what's going in the subconscious mind and you make a change, it radically changes your life. And so it's, there's a gift in it. And that's what I love. I don't know if this is sort of a, a lame question or not, but never a lame question. <laughs> well, wait to hear it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Bring it. <laughs> so, so through all of your research and your experience and your successes, not just with yourself, but with others, what would you say really gets in the way of our body's ability to heal itself? What gets in the way? I would say multiple things. I would say, if I were going to go through a, a list and name them off, I would say some people, they have wounding and they don't want to let it go. They have a resentment or an anger or an upset and they do not want to let it go. That's one thing. I would say another thing is, is that a lot of people have so many misconceptions about emotions. I can't tell you how often I've seen people who have been on the healing journey for 20 years, 30 years, who haven't healed themselves, and they think they have resolved an emotion. It's kind of like this. Like one hugely common misconception is this, is that somebody might have hurt from the past. And then they say, well, I forgave the person. And they expect it to be gone. Mm. And it's, that's like looking in your refrigerator and seeing food from 10 years ago and saying, but I forgave it. And that doesn't make yeah. it go away. 
That's why, I mean, I'm, I'm a talk therapist, but I think talk therapy is limited because it helps us to understand and develop beautiful insights as to, oh, that's why I feel the way I feel. Or that's why I behave or react the way I do. But it doesn't necessarily get rid of the reason why that's happening, right? And how it's living in your body and having an influence. You can be aware of it and you can say, yeah, intellectually, I, I forgive this person. But maybe deeper down inside, it's not quite reaching that true, like, what does forgiveness really, really mean? I mean, it's a tough question, I think. That's just using your example, but I think yeah. there's probably lots of examples like that. I think also when you asked me, that must have been really hard. And I said, I let all those feelings go. This is what remains for me is exactly that example. Like, it's kind of like when you just really don't have the emotions anymore at all, and they're actually gone, it's that feeling. And so I would say the emotion is just not there. And one key piece of that can also be changing your perception. You know, I mean, no matter how hard I try, I can't really find the, the feeling that Santa Claus is real. And I can't, I, it's not there. I don't have it. And so what I would say is, Sometimes a radical shift in perception can also be, but a lot of times what can happen is people want to validate their emotions. They want them to feel understood. They want them to feel validated. Very true. So yeah. I would say that blocks people. I would say another thing that blocks people are underlying patterns of guilt or shame that they have, that it's a pattern and it keeps them from making a shift. I would say that's another, there's, there's so many, but yeah, I mean, that's what I always tell people because they'll see me help somebody shift out of pain very quickly and it looks like magic. And I say, but, but it takes real change. So I have helped people shift under medical equipment where you can see it shift out of pain and they release it and it stays. And years, years, years later, it's gone. It hasn't come back because they embrace that change. But if somebody goes back into the negative, like right afterwards, if they mm. say, okay, well, you know, let's say they have a lot of hurt from their husband. And so we shifted out of the hurt, but then they go home and they have an argument with him, then it could come back. And it's something that they really need to make an actionable step to integrate in their lives. And so it's, it's real change. You can't trick your mind. No, you can't. Um, you can certainly try. Uh -huh. <laughs> but there's also a phenomenon where people identify with their wounding. Like it becomes a part of their identity. And That's so to, to let go of that is, well, who am I if I'm not this wounded, angry, sad, depressed person? Absolutely. Yeah. And that's when I mentioned there was multiple ingredients and some ingredients make cake, some make different recipe. That's exactly what happens is there's a combination. And part of that combination can be the self-image where people have started to identify with the injury. So yeah, in a lot of cases too, you're talking about people's relationship with power. So when you have that perspective, you are powerless to your illness, to your wounding, and it's hard to heal when you're in a place of powerlessness. And what you're trying to do, it seems like, is to remind people how powerful they are. That's ultimately my goal is this, is that the other day I worked with this woman, beautiful, beautiful being, had foot pain for many, many, many years and helped her and been everywhere and done all these things. And I helped her just shift out of it. And she was like, I'm flabbergasted. Like, I don't even know what to say. I'm, I'm astounded like that we can actually just do this. It, it would be like if somebody's walking around with anxiety attacks, anxiety attacks, and they didn't know it was connected to an emotion. And they're like, I don't know, my body just keeps doing this. And they had no idea that there was an emotional component. They're like, I don't know, every so often, like, I just can't breathe. And I don't know why. And let's, let's run some tests on it. Let's figure it out. Let's do this. Let's do that. And it's like, well, if you resolve the emotions, you, you'll stop going into those places where you can't like, so we know that there's an emotional component there. And, and so if somebody has foot pain or knee pain or an illness or thigh or all these things, there is an emotional component that we're not even addressing. And so the way I kind of look at it is also people used to believe that it was impossible for human beings to run a, a mile in under four minutes. And then there's the four minute mile where Roger Bannister did that. And then after that, people were realized that we could do that. And more and more people did that and broke that record. And what I see all the time is people start to realize, oh, we can release pain. We can heal our bodies. We can do this. And then I'll have people who message in and say, oh my gosh, you know, 
Brandy, I learned how to do it. Like I just released my pain and my headache went away or this, that, the other. And oh my gosh, I did it. And that a hundred percent, that to me is what, if everybody knows that we can do these things, that's what's incredible. And that's my second favorite word is possibility. I love that. I mean, we're limited by what we think is possible. Yeah. So there's so many different directions because your book covers so much ground. There's a lot of really good, rich material in there, including very explicit steps to walk someone through the process of everything you've learned and what you did to heal yourself and how you're working with other people. So I encourage people, if they're intrigued, to check out your book. Are you working with people? You've referenced a couple of times that you work with folks one-on-one. -on -one. So I take people on my podcast and I'll show them how to release their own pain or under medical equipment. And I just actually had some case studies published in a medical journal recently. And, and so my drive is to demonstrate it. And so a lot of times I don't work with people one-on-one. -on -one. I work with people in classes or they go through my video course because to me, the ultimate empowerment is everybody feeling empowered in themselves. And so that's ultimately what I'd love to see. But yes, I do work with some people sometimes, but that's mainly how I operate. If people wanted to learn more, you said you have an online course. I do have an online course. And a podcast. And a podcast. And on the podcast, that is exactly what I do is I just take volunteers who are experiencing pain and I show them how to release it. And it's really cool. And on my website, there's a video of me working with somebody under thermal medical equipment. And so uh, Dr. Hillary Smith, so when I do it under medical equipment, I use medical thermal imaging. And what that is, is basically it's, as the name says, thermal imaging. And so it shows the heat from the body. And an, an easy way to think about it is if you've ever had an infection or um, a sprained ankle or something like that, and there's heat from it. Let's say somebody has neck pain, you'll see the scan will be all red. And then I'll show somebody how to release their own pain. And you'll literally see the scan go from red to green as their pain goes away. And so on my website, there's also a video of me doing that very thing and showing somebody under the scan how to release their own pain. So yeah, it's pretty incredible what we are all capable of. Yes, it is. All right. So how do people find you? My website is brandygilmore.com and Gilmore has two L's. All right. So you can check out Brandy's website then if you want to learn more. Is there anything in closing that you feel like I didn't really cover and you want to get out there? I think in closing, I would say that number one, two, so two specific things. I would say one, it's truly incredible what we're capable of. And I mentioned pain, but I've seen people heal from all kinds of things. And it's not just about belief. It's far beyond. So people a lot of times think, oh, well, you have to believe. And what started me even on my journey is I have a history of taking people who don't believe where people say, oh, that's impossible. And I say, okay, let's go. Come on. That's, <laughs> that's got to be very rewarding. <laughs> it, it is because it they're told amazed. you. <laughs> it's, it's more so I didn't feel like I could. It's more so waking up the old me who didn't feel like I could do it also. It's more so showing people that it's not all about belief. And I would say that. And, and so that's the first thing. And the second thing, Wendy, I have to say, you're just lovely. You're lovely. You're wonderful. You're just a, a pleasure to sit and have a conversation. Oh, with. how nice. I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> Thank you. That's very kind. Oh, yeah. right back at you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming on and chatting with me. I really appreciate it. Likewise. Likewise. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. And she totally took me by surprise at the end there. <laughs> if you'd like to learn more about Brandy and her rapid healing technique, please check out her website, brandygilmore.com. Thank you very much for listening. And a huge thank you to Stephanie and Joanna for their generous donations to the podcast. Doing this show takes a bit of time <laughs> and expense. So donations of any amount are incredibly helpful and very much appreciated. Plus, they send the message that you'd like me to keep going. If you'd like to donate, there's a support this podcast link at the end of the show notes. All right, that's it for today's episode. Until next time.